Hello, and welcome to the Advanced Practice Provider webinar series hosted by Navi Medical. Today's topic is so many options, choosing the right system and the right patient for both SES and PNS. We would like to remind our viewers that medical opinions expressed herein are those of the healthcare provider presenters. Individual experiences and outcomes may vary. This material does not substitute medical expertise nor replace review of applicable product instructions for use. NALU's award-winning system is designed to address major unmet needs in the treatment of chronic neuropathic pain and provide a differentiated value position for both patients and physicians. NALU Medical recognizes the therapy expansion opportunities within both peripheral nerve stimulation and spinal cord stimulation. We look to partner and collaborate with all interested parties to further expertise, share experiences, and grow the practicing community. We would like to now pass along the program to our esteemed APP presenters, Casey Grillo and Camilla Banks. May Ann Thomas, the agenda is now yours. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I just want to introduce myself real quick. My name is May Ann Thomas. I am a representative of NALU. I'm currently part of our PNS market development team where we have kind of dug in deep. We're trying to learn as much about PNS as we can and then bring it out to folks such as yourself, just to further the space. I'm also currently leading the charge on our APP education program. So this webinar is also uh, near and dear to my heart. We wanna spread the message of NALU and the therapy in general. So like I said, thank you again for joining us. Um, we did have the opportunity to ask you a few questions when you first jumped on the webinar this evening. Before I jump into our agenda, I just wanna talk about the different poll results that we have seen. If we can get that up real quick. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so the first question we asked, and obviously these questions are why we're here this evening, right, is are you comfortable presenting NALU as an SES option to your patients? So, which is wonderful. We see 54% said yes, right? 46% looks like we need a little bit more information to get you more comfortable, but that's why you're here. So this is wonderful news. Uh, our second question was, are you comfortable identifying PNS candidates in your practice? Uh, this was slightly a pointed question. We know PNS is a new therapy out there for a lot of you all. So these answers are very telling, right? So 32% of you feel really comfortable identifying those PNS candidates in your practice. It looks like 46%, which is, I think I would say about 50% of you, right, would like more information, right? PNS is such a large scope with so many different nerve targets in the body. There's always a lot more to learn, right? And then 21% of you know, I'm not comfortable identifying the PNS candidates yet. And that's, like I said, that's why you're here. So we're super excited to be engaging with you all tonight. So let's go ahead and jump into the agenda. Um, uh, real quick, you're gonna see here, we're gonna do just a brief overview of the NALU micro technology. I'm just gonna go through a few slides with you just to set the foundation so everybody feels comfortable with the products that you have available today. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Casey Grillo. So she is gonna talk about the selection criteria for spinal cord stimulation and how you educate the patients on the different classes of IPGs. And then she'll hand it over to Camilla Binks, who's gonna talk about the selection criteria for PNS. Um, at the end of Camilla's presentation, we're gonna do another quick poll, and then we're gonna do a moderated Q&A. So if during the presentation this evening, if you have any questions, you're gonna see on the bottom of your screen, you, at any time you can type in a question, and we're gonna be addressing these at the end. So feel free, you don't need to wait to the end to start typing it in if something hits you. Um, so know that that's an opportunity. But with that, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into just a few product slides and we'll move on from there. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of my background and why I'm so passionate about our therapy and not only, you know, NALU, but our therapy in general is I'm a nurse by training. I actually started uh, back in neuromodulation in 2007. This is my fourth neuromodulation company. So uh, good news guys, I can tell you neuromodulation works no matter what company you work for. And we all on this call know what a huge impact it can have on patients' lives. So it's just really, it's been a career that I've just been in for 15 years and I've not looked back at all. One real quick point I wanna share is the reason I'm with NALU is I think we have a great opportunity in what we can provide to our patients. So for the first time, we actually have the opportunity to offer the patients to wear the battery on the outside. So I'll jump into that a little bit in a few slides, but I just want to put that pointer in there of why we are so excited about this technology. So thank you. And I'll go to the next slide, Jeff. Thank you so much. 
So I wanna talk a little bit about our micro IPG. Um, if everybody has been doing SDS for a few years, just such as myself, you're used to the battery IPGs that are on the market. If you look to the left slot, uh, sorry, the left side of this slide, you'll see the, the normal can that you would see with the other vendors, the, the battery with the IPG all in one. So about 80% of this battery IPG is the battery. So with Nalu, we took the battery component out and that's what the patient wears on the outside. But you'll see that, that green board that's in the middle. So that's the smarts of the system. That's actually the computer board that's doing all the programming, all the, the smarts and intellect with the, with the system. So what our engineers did was actually micro-sized that computer board into the chip that you see to the right. And then that chip was placed into our micro IPG. I'll hold that up there. So not only did they micro-size the current uh, state of the technology that's on the market, but they advanced it with the computer chip that was made. So our system is actually called an open state machine. So with the other battery IPGs that you may be familiar with, when they're originally designed, they're designed for whatever waveform at the time that they're trying to deliver. With our system, and you're about to find out how you know, long it will be able to stay in the body, our engineers wanted to make it so that it was truly upgradable because we don't know what the new waveforms are going to be in five to 10 years or the new advancements in the space. And we want to make sure that our micro IPG can keep up with that technology. One more thing I'm going to point out on this slide is if you see along the bottom, we've actually won several awards for this advancement in the technology of our space, which we're pretty proud of. I'm not going to go over every one, but I want you to just look at that one on the bottom left hand corner, the R&D 100. So this one we're most proud of. Just to give you an idea of some of the other winners in the space are the quantum computer satellites that are currently in space floating around. So we're in pretty good company. So like I said, we're pretty proud of that achievement. We can go to the next slide. So I just want to briefly go over the components of our system. So as you know, we're FDA cleared for both SES and PNS. On the left side here, you'll see we have both a four contact untimed lead a four contact time lead that is just for PNS, but those times are that built-in anchoring system. And then we have an eight contact untimed lead, which is the normal SCS lead you're used to seeing. It's a multi-lumen construction, but it can be used for both SCS and PNS. And then you'll see four IPGs that we have next to it, but it really all you need to know is that you can do up to two leads per IPG. We can either do a single or a dual system for whatever, lead configuration that you're, you need for that patient. Um, uh, one other thing I'll point out on the right is our patient peripherals, right? Remember we took out 80% of that uh, battery and put it externally. So you'll see our wonderful therapy disc in the bottom right-hand corner. And the patient's remote is actually an app that they can use either on their smartphone or on an iPod touch that's provided to them. For those patients that are very technologically challenged and you just don't wanna overwhelm them with an app of any kind, the patients actually also can control it from the therapy disc. You'll see a, a cute little graph that's coming out of the therapy disc. This is a depiction of our new activity monitor that we just launched, which is also something we're excited about. This is gonna give you the opportunity to be able to get a baseline of activity level from your patient because there's an accelerometer within our therapy disc. And then you'll be able to track their activity level as they continue to improve and do better and be able to improve their quality of life with their spinal cord stimulator or peripheral nerve stimulator through NALU. So it's another metric now that you'll be able to chart and provide to your patients so they can see that, you know, they're not only feeling better pain-wise, but they're getting around better. They're, they're doing more activities, they're busier. So it's, it's a wonderful addition to just the, the normal clinical approach we've been doing for years. Next slide, please. So just wanted to give you a better understanding of what's internal, what's external. Um, you'll see here that the lead, obviously this is depicting an SCS patient. The leads are placed in the epidural space, just like you would with your other SCS system that's on, on the marketplace. So T8, T9, anywhere in that thoracic area. And then the micro IPG is actually implanted just right underneath the skin. So right underneath the dermal letter, layer, either on the right or the left flank of the lower back. And then this next slide, I'm gonna show the external components. So as I talked about, we have the therapy disc and we also have the adhesive clip. I just wanna talk briefly about our adhesive clip. So this is a medical grade adhesive. It's actually a hydrocolloid base, 
which we actually gained from the ostomy space. So anybody that's familiar with the ostomy space and um, the medical grade adhesive they have to use, it has to be breathable, it has to be comfortable, it has to be able to hold a lot of weight. And think about what those patients are dealing with. There's so much affluent, there's risk for infections. We have a very low use for the type of um, hydrocolloid uh, adhesive that we use. And the allergic rate is less than 0.4%. We have three different flavors of this. So we figure out what works best for our patients. But as I'll show you later, our patients find this system very comfortable. Next slide, please. So just to reiterate, we have a highly capable SES system, but something that has really opened up the industry for us and the space is that we have a nice PNS form factor. So if you think about back in the day when we, you know, physicians would be trying to implant these PNS systems, they only had those large battery IPGs to place. That's pretty hard to place in the limbs or the extremities. So now we have a system that can do everything, a highly capable SCS system, but yet in a PNS form factor. So it's opened up a lot more patients now that we can care for. Next slide, please. This slide is just giving you an idea of some of our top PNS targets and where this is placed. You'll see the IPG is placed underneath the skin and then where they wear the therapy disc right on top of it. We have a little bit of wiggle room, but we do wanna make sure that those patients are wearing their therapy disc right over on top of where that micro IPG is implanted. Next slide, please. I just want to talk a little bit more about our therapy disc. So obviously you heard in my voice how proud we are of this advanced technology with our micro IPG, but we did want to make sure that our wearable is going to be comfortable and that a patient would even be open to having the wearable on. So, but prior to even having our first NALU patient implanted, NALU as a company went ahead and did a third party survey where they gathered 59 different chronic pain patients that reflect the demographic of who those SES patients are and PNS patients are in your practice. Same kind of pain scores, same kind of demographics, age ranges. And they were presented with a NALU system, a rechargeable um, SES system and a non-rechargeable SES system. And in those patients, when they were fully educated on all three options, 63% chose NALU. And if you'll see over here to the right of the slide, these are the reasons they gave for why they decided they wanted the NALU device. So the first reason doesn't surprise us. This is super tiny. This is the system I would want because of the size of the IPG. The second um, reason was there's no additional battery replacement surgeries for at least a couple decades. We have an 18 year service life for our micro IPG. I'm gonna stress that again. We have an 18 year service life for our micro IPG. So these patients can at least get a couple decades before they need to have an additional surgery for their system. The third reason was the patients did not wanna have an implanted chemical battery. And then the last was they liked that it was controlled by a smartphone. They didn't have to get a separate programmer out. They could just boop, 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 make little changes on their phone in the app and nobody would be the wiser. Next slide, please. So now we know from this survey, patients will choose this. Patients will choose this system, but we took it one step further and we started asking about a comfort score. So this is where we um, had our first in human study over in Australia. And we asked our patients on a 10 point scale that reflects that pain scale, right? With 10 being the most uncomfortable, zero being extremely comfortable. What was the comfort level of wearing their therapy disc, especially with this clip? And you'll see we had an average of one for these patients. That's how comfortable they find our system. Our initial NALU implant patients are now over three years out. And we love to add up this number. We've had over 5 million wear hours with all of our patients together. So we are at the point as a company as we really understand our wearable. We know how to make it work for a patient. We know how, to be, how it's gonna be comfortable for them. We've truly found a, a viable option for these patients out there. Next slide, please. Now, with this paradigm shift of an external battery, we also want you all to feel comfortable that we, we still have all the wonderful waveforms that you're gonna need to be able to reprogram your patients. We are not a one waveform company, although you're gonna see here in the bottom in a second, we do have some novel opportunities to provide to your patient, but we wanna put the patient first. We wanna program specifically for the patient and give them what they need. And that might change in three to six months. So we have all of these, these options. 
So we can do everything on the marketplace today that's not patent prohibited. So you'll see, obviously, we can do tonic, pulse dosing, current steering. We have our own version of burst. We can do scheduling, paired therapies, combined therapies. Now, what's very unique to Nalu is we can do current steering and PNS. We are the only PNS company that has brought current steering to the space, which is exciting. When you're, you can really track down that specific spot on the nerve so you can get that patient the coverage they need. We've also just launched the first ultra long pulse width. So 2000 microseconds. This is the largest pulse width in the space. We're new with it. We're gonna see what happens. We're still not 100% sure, but it's a great opportunity, especially in the PNS space to see how this can better help our patients. And then we also have our own novel waveform, which is called the pulse stimulation pattern. Uh, this has been specifically for SCS, but we're starting to look at it in the PNS space as well. It's a multi-leveled waveform that in theory we're feeling works on different mechanisms of action. It's sub-threshold, anatomically placed. But once again, we're not a one waveform company, but we know that this provides a lot of great relief to these patients. Next slide, please. One slide, guys, that's it. That's all you have left with me. So I just wanna reiterate, so our having this external battery is a little bit different than hardly what you're used to in your clinics if you haven't already been use, utilizing NALU. Because this IPG lasts up to 18, I'm sorry, at least 18 years in the patient's body, we like to add a step to the process. You'll see that we have a trial, we have a perm, and then life resumed, right? Step forward, that's when you just do any maintenance for the patient, any reprogrammings they need. We like our patients prior to even getting to trial, if possible, to wear a dummy therapy disc so we can figure out the most comfortable place for them. So your physicians will know specifically where to put this micro IPG. We have them do this for about seven to 10 days. And that really enables them to find the spot where after a couple of days, it just melts in the background. And that's what our patients say. I've even had patients that have worn it for 15 minutes and forgot they were wearing it. But our goal of that wear experience is just making sure they find a comfortable spot and they just stop thinking about it, that it just melts into the background. So it's not something that's on their mind. I will finish up with my part. We can go to the next slide. I'm gonna hand it over to Casey Grillo. Casey, thank you so much for joining us this evening and partnering with us. Um, here you go, guys, here's Casey. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And of course, thank you for to Nalo, Nalo for having this webinar for APPs. I really do appreciate the commitment and the dedication that you have to APP education always. So my name is Casey Grillo. Uh, I'm a nurse practitioner at the Spine and Pain Institute of New York. I work alongside Dr. Kenneth Chapman and Dr. Kieran Patel in New York City. I work at a very large interventional pain practice and I've been there for eight years now. Eight years ago when I started, we didn't have these options that we have today or these tools that we have today to treat patients. So for me, um, watching the evolution and the innovation happen has been really exciting because it offers me an opportunity to treat many patients that have been far out of reach and very challenging to treat because we didn't have many options for them. So I'm very excited that I, my practice has adopted NALU and uh, now I've opened up the door for many patients to have a therapy that can possibly change the quality of their life. So with that, we'll talk a little bit about some selection criteria for SES patients. So when we are selecting patients for therapy, it is essential that we choose the correct therapy for the right patient. With that, we'll see success and better outcomes, right? And as advanced practice providers, this is what we do. We identify our patients. We have to take thorough histories and physicals and help our physicians, collaborate with our phys physicians to decide which therapy is appropriate for which patient. When we have these considerations in mind, patients that are not good candidates for additional surgeries, NALU has an external battery. We eliminate the need for additional surgeries. 
no battery replacements. So for your patient that may have comorbidities and may not get medical clearance for surgery, or your patient that just does not want to have any more surgery, patients that are scared of more surgery, uh, somebody who's older than 75, and it puts them at considerable risk for infection or complications, we now have another option to offer them. We also have to consider some out-of-pocket costs now. Lots of patients have, they're in these donut holes and they have high deductibles and co-pays and out-of-pocket expenses are something that we need to keep in mind. Recharge burden. For any of you that offer neuromodulation and offer rechargeable devices, I'm sure that you hear from your patients that it's a hassle to recharge a device. It's it takes out time from their busy schedules. It's a constant reminder to them that they have a device and that they are suffering, suffering from chronic pain. And it's one of the top reasons that we see explants happen and no patient satisfaction. So something to keep in mind for your patient that may not be a good candidate um, for a rechargeable device. Pocket pain for our small, elderly, fragile patients that are thin, and we suspect that they may get some benefit from neuromodulation, but may suffer from pocket pain. We see this complaint quite often with patients that the device is uncomfortable and it's um, something else for them to focus on and be unhappy with. So we have also with NALU have eliminated pocket pain for patients. Incision sizes are small and we have decreased infection risks without having those surgeries. As an example, of uh, two patients that I have right now in our authorization queue. So these two patients are in the process of getting authorization for SES. One of my patients had failed back surgery. He had failed an SES trial many years ago. Um, and when he came to my office, he was on Tylenol with codeine and Lyrica and said, I only want the opioid. My functional capabilities are not where I want them. I'm unhappy, but I'm there's no chance of me having surgery and, and having an implanted device. So for this patient, I was like, well, what if we talked about an external battery and not having surgery? And he was open to that. And the next visit, we brought his daughter in and we gave him, showed him the device. And third visit, we put an authorization for him. So for this is a patient that maybe had gone down the road of just being on Tylenol with codeine and not doing very well with that to now being able to have the opportunity to improve his functional, his functional abilities. My second patient right now that's in the authorization process is a female who's a singer in New York City. She sings at a jazz club and she's thin and she likes to wear tight fitting clothes and she's vain. And she said, no chance. I'm not having anything that protrudes out of my skin. There's no chance of me having an implanted device. So when I showed her that this disc is, she can take it off when she sings, right? It gives her more flexibility. It can be more adaptable to her lifestyle. We were able to offer her something that met more of her needs. So those are just two examples that uh, I wanted to share with you guys because those are two patients that right now are, are in authorization process. Okay, next slide. So there's a, a distinct difference, right, between these implantable batteries and the, the NALU device. If you look at the on the side of the slide, the difference in size, right, the size of a dime is so small. With the larger implanted batteries, we have larger incis incisions. We risk pocket pain, right? And I know this slide says 21% of patients. In my experience, it's higher than that. Many patients complain of pocket pain, right? It's probably the number one complaint that I get from patients. We increase their infection rates. And we, we have to consider additional surgeries for repeated battery replacements. 22% of MDRs cited that there are device charging problems, battery problems, and premature discharge of battery, right? So these are all complications that we can eliminate with a smaller IPG and an external power source. 25% of patients who are offered an SES device decline the therapy. I was instrumental in adopting this therapy in my practice because I saw the need for it. We had a role for it. Those patients that did not want an implantable battery were sitting in our office and 
they were kind of like hamsters on a hamster wheel, right? We're just giving them neuropathic medications, they're getting injections, but we're not, we were not getting sustained relief with them. So when I saw that um, there was NALU available, I was so excited and I had brought it to the attention of the physicians I work with and we have adopted that therapy. And it's really exciting because now it offers us the opportunity to help these patients that have not had great options otherwise. Next slide. Back to recharge burden and managing the implantable battery, right? So when you think of recharging on the high end, they're charging daily 30 to 60 minutes and on the low end, once a week, two to three hours. So what we see is, you know, the hassle from it, patients often forget to charge it. So they'd come in with the batteries depleted and then not on for weeks. And then they forget about it and they lose their motivation. They complain about the constant reminder of having to recharge. So I think in my practice, we don't even offer those devices anymore because of the outcomes that we were having with them, that we were just getting too many complaints and patients wanted them explanted ultimately. Um, so now, you know, not having to recharge the Nalu device will, the battery, the team will give you the patient two batteries fully charged so that one battery can always be charging. And when they wake up in the morning, they can just switch out that device, takes under a minute, they don't have to think about it and they don't have that constant reminder. So we, we eliminate the recharge burden for the patients. Next slide. IPG end of life and replacement. This is an interesting slide. So the Cleveland Clinic did a comparative study of 897 systems um, looking into the median IPG longevity. And what they found was with primary cell IPGs, the battery life was 3.68 years and with rechargeable IPGs, 7.20. But if you look over to the left of the manufacturer labeling, tells a different story, right? So we're telling patients five to 10 years, but that may not necessarily be true. So this is something to keep in mind for our patients that may have potential complications with surgery, may not be good candidates for additional surgery, or for people or younger patients that just may not want to go in for repeat surgeries every, you know, three to five years, right? So for younger patients, this is something that they have to consider. Um, so again, very important to keep in mind when you're offering this therapy to your patients. Next slide. The new class of SCS systems, right? So you look at the primary cell, the rechargeable IPG, these are big, right? The size, I mean, it's so exciting to see now we needed this small IPG. Uh, it's really been transformative because the role, we, the role is there for our patients. And now having this IPG that's the size of a dime, is amazing for, for so many of our patients. The incision size is much smaller. So for your patients that are diabetic or smokers or have vascular disease, um, patients that don't, women that don't, or men that cosmetic don't want the larger incisions, the incision is so much smaller. Now they have the option to have an external battery that they can take on and off that's more flexible, durable, and adaptable for them, 18-year battery life. So for many patients, they may never have to think about that again, right? For our older patients, no surgery required. And again, speaking to um, what I had reiterated to what I just said about swip, swapping out the batteries so that they don't have to recharge and think about it, it takes under a minute and it's hassle-free. The benefits of an external wearable battery, right? We spoke to a lot of that, um, but to echo on what I just said previously, longevity matters. We now can offer a patient a therapy that can offer them chronic pain management in their journey, right? Can help meet their needs in a more flexible way. We eliminate risks and costs associated with the surgeries, program for the needs of the patient, not the battery easily upgradable for the future, right? Technology is always evolving and changing. So having the option to have a non-invasive upgrade 
is amazing and no reports of pocket pain, which is really such a big deal for me in my practice because I do have a lot of older patients that are such great candidates for this therapy, but I think that some of them may end up with pocket pain that is more uncomfortable than the benefit of it. So having that has been really transformative to, to us in our practice. The wear experience Mayan spoke about a little bit, but this is um, really, it's a nice touch for the patient if they're really uh, hesitant. And I, you'll see quite often when you recommend this therapy to patients that they are hesitant when they see the size of the disc. They're like, oh, that's going to be uncomfortable. Where will I put it? So we can calm some of their, fe their anxieties and their fear related to it by letting them try it. You have your NALU team come in, um, they place it in a comfortable spot for the patient, let them wear it, go home with it, live with it. And what you'll find is that, like Mayan said, they forget about it. It just becomes a part of them. And it's not as big of a deal as the patient anticipates that it will be. So having this wear experience is really helpful in helping the patient to decide to, to go ahead with the therapy. And now I'll pass this along to my colleague, Camilla Banks. All right, thank you so much. Can you see me okay? Yeah. <laughs> My name is Camilla Binks. I am a nurse practitioner out of Scottsdale, Arizona. I've been in pain management now for um, eight years and in Arizona for um, six of those years. And I'm very passionate about NALU. I'm very, very passionate about what it, um, what it brings for our patients and the option that it gives them. Um, so peripheral nerve stimulation has, has been around for a while, and Mayan spoke to it that the form factor of the, of the NALU device really allows our patients um, to be able to, to have a therapy without um, the burden of having a large um, IPG implanted. And so that gives us the freedom to place the, the micro IPG at uh, various locations that are best suited for the patients. Um, so uh, Jeff, next slide, please. So pre-op considerations for uh, peripheral nerve stimulation is um, similar to, to any other advanced procedure. We need to think about patient safety and compliance. Um, the patients do still need to have a behavioral health um, evaluation prior to peripheral nerve stimulation. Um, again, history of post-op infections, Casey touched on this. Um, the, the size of the IPG um, really does negate a lot of uh, post-op infections in these patients. Obviously, cardiac and blood thinner clearance is still, um, still an issue to consider, even if we are going to a peripheral nerve. Um, and then wearability. Will the patient be able to wear the external battery at the indicated site? And then to have that open communication with the patients about their expectations, their risks, and the benefits of, of having the knowledge device. Next slide, please. Contraindications, obviously, if they're unable to operate the system for whatever reason, um, that would be a, a contraindication. The difference with the NALU device as well is that they, they will um, be given um, either an iPod um, or a device where they can control the programs or they can download an app to their smartphone um, and control, control the programs through their smartphone or um, from the therapy disc itself. And so some of those older uh, patients that maybe are not as tech savvy and can't operate uh, the control on the cell phone, they can use the therapy disc as well um, to control their program. Obviously, if they're a poor surgical candidate, they're, they're likely not, um, or they're not a candidate for uh, the NALU system and pregnancy is also a contraindication. Uh, peripheral nerve stimulation with the NALU device is not indicated for fibromyalgia or phantom limb pain, um, diffuse polyneuropathy, or angina pectoris. Uh, next slide, please. The patient education for these patients is very similar to um, spinal cord stimulation. The peripheral nerve stimulation trial will be roughly five to seven days. We typically do seven days if we can. The patient will need to keep the site clean and dry. Um, the NALU representative will monitor these patients closely, um, speak to patient outcomes. Um, they come in similar to a spinal cord stimulator trial where the trial will be removed after the five to seven days. And then if the patient um, gets relief, then we implant. 
And the implant is similar again to spinal cord stimulation, usually um, seven to ten, 10 days to heal. Again, the micro IPG is so small, it's no bigger than than my pinky finger. And so the incision itself is, is, does not take long to heal. And then again, the NALU representative will closely monitor those patients um, to, to target the desired outcomes. Um, one of the things to consider um, with, with the implant is the uh, peripheral nerve targets, we use timed leads. And so it allows the patient to have more mobility, but they still should be careful in that first uh, seven to 10 days. Next slide, please. So tonight we're going to talk about the three, three of the main targets for peripheral nerve stimulation. Again, this is just a broad overview. This isn't um, specific to everything that we can do with a NALU device for peripheral nerve stimulation, um, but we'll just talk about three of the main targets. Um, and I actually have three different uh, patients to talk about with each one of these um, in, our, in our practice here. Next slide, please. Um, shoulder pain. Um, typically with shoulder pain, we are targeting the suprascapular nerve. The suprascapular nerve um, runs along the back of the shoulder. And so these are patients um, that may have pain in the back, even into the humeral head or into the bicep. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So the suprascapular nerve arises from the superior trunk of the brachial plexus, primarily from the C5 and C6 nerve roots. It passes laterally through the suprascapular notch um, and then into the scapular ligament. Typically, these are um, either nerve entrapment syndromes or they're uh, post-surgical shoulder pain. Not always, um, but, but you do need to identify that, that, it's, that it's nerve impingement or a neuralgia of the suprascapular nerve prior, um, prior to trialing. Um, these patients usually um, they're maybe have a rotator cuff injury, a repetitive overhead activity like a baseball pitcher or a quarterback. Um, chronic excessive stretching of the nerve, and then again, uh, in nerve entrapment after shoulder surgery or a neuralgia after sh shoulder surgery. Uh, Post-stroke post shoulder pain as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these patients usually have chronic shoulder pain that's poorly localized. Again, it's often in the top of the shoulder or the back of the shoulder. They may have weakness, numbness, heaviness. They may complain of burning or radiating pain into the neck, back, or arm. And this is pain that worsens with shoulder movement. Again, we want to palpate the supraspinatus notch to, to ensure that it's suprascapular nerve uh, pain. They may have frozen shoulder or, or a hesitancy to, to move the shoulder. They may even present with muscle atrophy. Um, next slide, please. So the nerve pain uh, workup for the suprascapular nerve, we talked about it. Um, palpating at the site, imaging to, to correlate if there's any other pathology um, or eliminate any other etiologies. They failed conservative treatments. And then in, in our practice, we, we always do a nerve block um, before we, we do stimulation just to identify that that's the correct nerve that we're targeting. Um, in the patient um, example from my own practice, he actually um, was in a motor vehicle accident and had shoulder pain after the accident, uh, paraplegic, so paralyzed from the waist down, but still just had this really bad shoulder pain. And um, he did not benefit from the suprascapular nerve block, but um, from a brachial plexus block, he did get benefit from that. So we actually did a, a, a PNS NALU trial at the brachial uh, plexus, and he got great relief with the trial and was implanted and continues to get relief. Um, next slide, please. All right, next we're going to talk about low back pain and specifically superior clunial nerves. So the clunial nerve um, runs along the top of the iliac crest, and there's three clunial nerves that, that run um, through there. And sometimes these are patients that may have had back surgery before, and they continue to have pain just along the top of the iliac crest. And um, these nerves actually run through um, in between several muscles. And so it's very likely that they can get, become entrapped. Um, again, maybe they've had a fusion, a discectomy, and it's not necessarily pain that's axial in nature around the medial branch block, but more specifically along the top of the iliac crest. 
Next slide, please. Um, again, usually laterally, um, it's off to one side. It's not directly over the spine. The pain is exacerbated with movement, physical activity, prolonged sitting or standing. Sometimes these patients present with radiculopathy, but I would say in, in, in my practice, they typically don't have a radicular nature. If they have any radicular symptoms, it's pain that, that radiates into the buttock. And usually um, you can identify these patients if say they come in and you think it's SI joint and you do an SI joint injection and they're still having pain, block the clunial nerve and see if they respond to a clunial nerve block. Next slide, please. So again, um, if they have failed like medial branch block, lumbar medial branch block or uh, RFA, if you palpate the, the clunial nerve at the top of the iliac crest and you're able to reproduce their pain, that's usually a good indicator that it's clunial nerve. Um, and then again, we, we always do a nerve block to see if, if that's the, the um, source of the pain. And then um, we've gotten really good relief um, from actually putting an electrode down near the clunial nerve and doing a trial and then an implant. Next slide, please. Um, knee pain. So this is, this is one of my favorites and I'm gonna share a story um, before we get started about a particular patient in my practice. So 60 um, year old male uh, presented to me with um, knee pain. He had had a total knee replacement and was continuing to have knee pain. So after uh, we did a genicular nerve block, he got minimal relief from the genicular nerve block, sent him back to the surgeon for, for an evaluation and actually had a total knee revision. The cement in the original surgery didn't take. And so that hardware was just loose and knocking around. So the surgeon performed a revision and the patient came back to me in, in severe pain, um, pain that wasn't controlled with very high dose opioids. And so we were all kind of scratching our heads. Could this be CRPS, um, neuralgia of some sort? Um, we did a lumbar sympathetic nerve block for this patient and he got minimal relief. We repeated the genicular nerve block and he got some relief, but not great relief. Um, and complaining of a lot of pain behind his knee and on the lateral side of his knee. So after about three months post-op where he wasn't progressing through therapy, he wasn't getting um, the relief that he thought, that his wife thought he should be getting and that the, the surgeon thought he should be getting, I recommended a, a NALU trial. And the approach for him was different than, as you can see in this picture, um, in this picture, they, they took two leads, one at the uh, superior medial and one at the superior lateral genicular nerve. And we actually placed one lead at the superior lateral and one um, in the posterior, sci sciatic, posterior sciatic nerve to capture the pain that was behind the knee. And during his trial, he, he was on very high dose opioids and was able to reduce them um, by half during the trial and then was implanted um, two or three weeks ago and getting 90% relief after his implant. So I'm, I'm very passionate, like I said before, I'm very passionate about NALU and what it can offer our patients. Um, next slide, please. Um, all right, so we hit on this. There's, there's three main nerves that supply the, the sensory input to the knee joint, the superior lateral genicular nerve, the superior medial genicular nerve, and then the inferior lateral, um, Oh, excuse me, inferior medial genicular nerve. And some studies um, have been done where to place one electrode just into the inferior medial genicular nerve and, and get relief of, of the knee joint as well. So um, as APPs, you know, the, the, the surgeon communicating with, with, your, with your physician as far as placement, um, and again, where, where the, the um, external battery is most comfortable for the patient makes sense too. Um, next slide, please. So again, these are patients that um, typically they have degenerative joint disease. They may or may not have had a total or a partial knee replacement in the past. Um, chronic compression of the nerves of the knee, fractures, maybe a crush injury. Um, pseudo gout, I would say is less common. Um, in, in our practice, I would say that most patients have had some sort of surgery to the knee. Um, next slide, please. These patients have um, intractable knee pain. Um, like I said, they're usually not very responsive to, um, to traditional therapy, steroid injections, visco supplementation. They may get um, limited relief from a genicular nerve block or an ablation. 
This pain is exacerbated by physical activity. They have weakness, instability of the knee joint. Sometimes they present with swelling, reduced range of motion, um, muscle atrophy. Next slide, please. Again, we always want to correlate um, the pathology um, of the patient with imaging. Um, obviously, if they have an infection of their knee, they're not a good candidate for simulation. We should we should send them to uh, a surgeon for evaluation. Um, but again, always do a nerve block um, to make sure that that the nerves that we're blocking are the target nerves, and then um, the trial as well. Next slide. So. Um, if I could leave you with a few thoughts, I would say that most of these peripheral nerve um, stimulation candidates are already in your practice. Um, we, we get a lot of referrals from outside uh, referral sources like podiatrists and orthopedic surgeons, um, but most of these patients are already in your practice and they're coming in for shoulder pain, knee pain, low back pain, foot and ankle pain. Um, and so really identifying those patients that are already in your practice and providing them with this therapy um, that in my experience has really changed a lot of my patients' lives. Um, again, these patients are, in our practice, we manage a lot of the chronic therapy. Um, and so seeing them on a monthly basis and really engaging um, with the patient and letting them know that this therapy is there um, to help them. And then the last bullet point there, um, it really does make sense to collaborate with your physician um, and see where they are comfortable with, uh, with targets, either with fluoro or with ultrasound. Um, and then um, that's really valuable to incorporating this within your practice. Next slide, please. And now I'm gonna turn it over to um, Jeff. Thank you so much. Casey and Camilla, thank you so much for your input in regards to your experiences with SES and PNS utilizing the NALU technology. Take a moment for you all to be able to kind of put in any questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens if you have anything that you would like to uh, discuss with our, with our team members here. At the same time, I'm going to actually go ahead and activate a, uh, a, an, an additional poll here to kind of get some additional information so that we can best uh, serve you here in the future. So with that being said, um, you know, uh, both for Casey and Camilla, uh, you know, looking at this poll that we have up, you know, one of which is related to uh, PNS candidacy and the type of patients that you're seeing in your practice today, what, uh, what are predominantly the, the patients that you're seeing? I see in my practice, we have a lot of patients that had joint surgery, specifically knee and shoulder that still have chronic pain after surgery and they don't want more surgery. They're not good candidates for surgery. So we have a ton of those patients. Um, they're typically managed with medications or injections, but they have, it's hard to get them to have any sustained relief. So that's what I see a lot of for PNS in my practice. Camilla, you may see a little bit more of a variety. I would I would say um, all, all of the ones we just talked about, but um, definitely knee, um, shoulder, uh, foot. We get, like I mentioned, we get a lot of referrals from foot and ankle surgeons. Um, I got one today actually where a podiatrist um, sent me a text message uh, with, e, with an EMG that was done and was like, do you feel like this patient would be a good candidate for uh, PNS? And my response was absolutely. Like we can always try, right? Like we can always do a trial and see if she responds. So um, that's probably my favorite one is foot and ankle because because the patients, all of the patients that we've trialed and implanted for for foot and ankle pain have done remarkably well. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Mayanne, before we jump into the uh, questions in the Q&A box here, our last question on the poll really references a number of different opportunities that we hope to kind of continue the dialogue and engagement with you all as APPs. And so, um, Mayanne, could you explain some of these opportunities? No, I'd be happy to, Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, so obviously, you guys are on our monthly national webinar. We're so happy to have you here. But we have planned a couple other events moving forward. We want to continue to engage with you. We don't want to invent. We want a, a full program to continue this dialogue, continue this communication. So a few things you'll see listed on that poll. Um, 
we are setting up more small format webinars. It's really would be a group of four to six APPs to be with one of our APP advocates. This, this would be virtual, just kind of a Zoom call if you would see that set up. We're gonna have it where you can talk about one specific nerve target. You can bring patients forth that you're considering if you wanna just bounce ideas off each other, either your colleagues or one of our APP advocates like Casey and Camilla. Uh, we also are going to be having an advanced APP course later on this year, if that's something you would be interested in, to not only further, further your knowledge in SES and PNS, but in pain management in general. Uh, we also are going to be up some upcoming conferences. So if you too will be at some upcoming conferences, please let us know. We have um, some APP receptions, dinners, lunches. Uh, if it's something you'd want to connect at any of these future events, please let us know, let your representatives know. Um, and we can also do one-on-ones, we can do local dinners where we either bring in a Casey or a Camilla or myself, um, a NALU personnel. We can do everything virtually, also in person. So you'll see all those different options. We want to be able to cater an educational plan to you. So just let us know what you're interested in and we're going to have your representative follow up with you. So I'm thinking, Jeff, well, should we go ahead and jump into the Q&A? Yeah, sounds great. Perfect. So um, I do have one question that popped up. So I'm going to, Camille, I'm going to have you start with this. And then Casey, I'm going to have you go second, just if you need to add anything. Uh, so one of our, our wonderful viewers was asking, um, how long after the selected nerve block should, would you then go to a PNS trial? I would say typically, um, no long, I mean, you don't have to wait an, an extended period of time, right? You could do a, a trial within a week, but realistically, you know, if you do the nerve block and you see the patient back in a week or two, and then you talk to them about doing a NALU trial and the wear experience, like it's probably going to be several weeks after the nerve block before they actually realistically get trialed, but there's not like a set in stone as far as how long they have to wait before the block and the trial. That's what, any, anything to add to that, Casey? Um, hold on, coming off on mute. <laughs> okay. We, yeah, we don't always do, um, nerve blocks, but I think it helps for confirmation. Um, so we, similar to, to Camilla, I, I don't think that it, most providers go off that algorithm. I think that's pretty standard. So it looks like we have a follow-up question to this question. So I just want to jump on it real quick. How successful does that nerve block have to be for you all to feel comfortable that it's a positive result? Does it have to be more than 50%? You know, does it have to be for an extended period of time? Does it even have to work for you to continue on with the trial? That's a good question. And I think that's really patient specific and provider specific. Um, so of course the insurance companies want to see a 50% improval, right? So they do wanna see that. But I don't think it's an it's an absolute necessity to have that if you're really confident based on physical findings, um, exam findings, on in image findings that this is the generator of pain. I think it's appropriate without even having a great response to a block to go ahead with a therapy. But that's go that's going to be up to your provider. You have to see where that sits, and that doesn't just happen with one visit. Camilla, do you ag agree with that or? Do you have a cutoff? No, I absolutely agree. I think that um, we want to see some relief from the nerve block, but it's not a hard and fast rule that if they don't get relief that that we can't do a trial. Um, because as as you know, as we know, sometimes they don't get relief from a nerve block, but they'll they'll respond to neurostimulation or stimulation of, of the nerve. Um, that being said, like typically we, we want to see some relief, even if it's for an hour or two after the nerve block that they had that they had some response. But again, it doesn't doesn't mean that they can't do a trial. Very good. We, um, we have another question. So when you're looking at a genicular stem, where would you normally have the patients try placing that therapy disc? Are there a few locations that you guys have tried out? I would say in, in my case, usually patients have the most um, success when it's on the lateral aspect of their thigh. 
Um, again, man, you talked about the, the therapy just kind of like melding into the background. And that's, that's where I typically see it. It's not rubbing against their, their pants and it's not catching on anything. If it's, if it's up kind of high and lateral on the thigh. Anything to add to that, Casey? Agree. You, you would not want it to be anywhere where, you know, they're bending or sitting on, right? So it's important to pick a spot that's very comfortable. Um, I would agree the lateral, lateral aspect of the thigh is the best. Um, and I'll just, I know the specific question was also, is there a concern with any kind of tight clothing? And just as I've, I've cared for a lot of the NALU patients out there as well. And we have had some patients that like to wear their Lululemon leggings, right? You know, it's a, it's a tighter material. And we've actually had success where if every, anybody is familiar with those leggings, sorry, gentlemen, you might not be, but there's a little pocket on the lateral aspect of the thigh where the patient actually can put the therapy disc in. And because the material is not it's not like a jean material, right? It's a really thin legging material. There's no issues with communication. So if you do run across a patient that might want to wear it in an area where there's a tighter clothing issue, you, we always also have belts. We have uh, limb cuffs. So we have other opportunities that we can try with those patients. And for those patients, the, they can try it, right? They can wear it with their leggings and see how it works for them. Perfect. I'm working through all of our questions. Uh, we do have a quick question about MRI compatibility. You guys want me to take that real quick? I probably have the, the most up-to-date information. Um, so we, um, every, obviously, you know, compatible is not the right word for any of our, the vendors or ourselves out there, but we are MRI conditional. So for SCS, um, we do have MRI conditional labeling for 1.5 Tesla for our 40 centimeter leads. And the lead placement is, is the normal SES placement, right? So the T8, T9 area of the thoracic, the IPG would be placed in, like we showed in the picture, either the left or the right lower flank area. So for PNS MRI conditional, we are currently head um, and extremities only. And the reason for that is we are um, in the process of submitting for a uh, further labeling for PNS. Uh, once we do, that will be launched to the field and it will be retroactive. So any patients implanted today will at that point be able to do a full body MRI. But at this point, they can get an MRI. Obviously, it would be with a head coil or with a limb coil. You just want to make sure that there's no uh, part of the product that's within the coil, if that makes sense, right? So if let's say this is a genicular patient, since we already kind of started talking about that, they couldn't get an MRI done of that, that knee area of that extremity, but they could have the opposing extremity, the upper extremities and the head. If there's any further questions about that, please just type that as well and we'll, we'll continue to address it. Um, okay, and then we also, we do have um, somebody who has a patient that had an allergic, that did have, I guess, a sensitivity or an allergy to the adhesive where the therapy disc was attached. So what are some tips regarding this issue? Anything that you guys have seen? Have you had? Have you come across any kind of sensitivities to the clip? I haven't had that yet, but I have had that with with patches and adhesives in general with patients, and we just try to encourage them to keep the area dry. You know, no lotions, no sun, um, and then if it's really irritating, what we will try is putting a little hydrocortisone around the adhesive for a short period of time. And sometimes that helps to calm it down and then they can get past it. But again, that would be something you'd have to talk to your physician about, but that's worked for us in our practice. And I would probably, before just giving up on it, I would try a little bit of hydrocortisone around it first, if it's really irritating. Sometimes there's just an adjustment period too. Some patients can have sensitive skin. Anything to add, Camilla, to that one? I haven't seen a reaction to the hydrocolloid dressing um, that's that's on the clip, um, but the belt is an option too, right? Like if they if they can't wear the the clip for the therapy disc, they can also utilize utilize the belt. Um, that's an option. That's great. So I I've had my share, like I said, of, of caring for a, a decent amount of these NALU patients. So I've never seen a true allergic reaction. But what I have seen is that because this is a medical grade adhesive, it sucks all those natural, you know, all the natural moisture from the skin. So if it's a patient that's prone to dry skin, that can be itchy, that can cause, you know, the patient to scratch the area and then it looks irritated. 
a wonderful benefit of taking this from the ostomy space is this has been studied for decades. It's been utilized. There's a lot of over-the-counter products as well. So we do have what's called a barrier cream that we can offer to those patients where it just is a thin layer and it prevents those natural oils from being sucked out of the skin. So that's always an option to utilize as well. Camilla, I love your idea of, you know, the neoprene belt, the limb cuffs, um, you know, and Casey, like you said, a little hydrocortisoid uh, or cortisone um, is great to apply to the area as well. So we do have three different flavors of the hydrocolloid um, clip. We also have a, a silicone clip for those patients that just cannot tolerate the hydrocolloid. Like I said, the allergy rate is less than 0.4%, so we don't expect that to be very many, but we do always have backup plans. For the, so for this specific patient, I would reach out to your local representative and see what we can do to help them out. Um, let's see there <laughs> real quick. I, I see this is a good one. We'll see if we can squeeze this one in real quick. Um, we have a question to see if you guys are willing to share your talk track or your conversation that you have with that patient at the lead poll when you're talking to them about the permanent system. And maybe just in bullet points, because I know we're running out of time here, but um, Camilla, maybe I'll have you start. Just are there certain, certain like key bullet points you want to make sure the patient understands prior to moving on to PERM? Well, I would say that most patients are in contact with the representative um, and they know, right, by the time they come into the office for the lead poll, they know if, if, they're, if they want to proceed with, with the permanent implant. And so usually the next step is how quickly can I get this scheduled, right? They're fearful, like you're going to take it out and turn it off and now I'm going to be in pain again. And so that's usually the, the number one question from patients is how quickly can we get this scheduled? Um, and then as far as moving the patients forward, I just let them know, like, this is a surgical procedure. There's things that we have to do. We have to get it approved. We'll get you in as soon as possible. Um, but in my experience, patients are very eager um, to move forward. I don't know, Casey, how, how's your experience? Same. And we've, you know, we, we, even though it's a small incision and a small IPG, there, there's still some post-operative teaching there. You know, we still want them to slow down and, you know, gradual functionality, um, be careful with their bending, their twisting, their lifting just for three months. Cause even though it's small, we still want scar tissue to form and, you know, to hold it in place. So you have very similar talk tracks as far as your post-operative management, even though it's a small incision, right? But you don't have to really get into pocket pain and what, what to expect as far as that's concerned. That's great. Thank you, ladies. Um, so it looks like we're probably about a out of time. For those who stuck around, we appreciate it. We went over by about five minutes, but I wanted to thank you both so much. Um, Casey and Camilla, thank you so much for partnering with us. You'll see that uh, Jeff left a wonderful slide for you guys all to check out before leaving us this evening. So like we said, we wanna continue this NALU dialogue. These are some upcoming conferences where we will be there and happy to engage with you. So. Uh, please reach out to your local representative if you know that you will be at an upcoming conference. We really would love to sit down with you, have a good conversation, get you connected with a Casey or a Camilla so you could really um, have a better understanding of that patient selection piece. So I'm going to go ahead and close it out unless there's anything else you want to say, Jeff. But thank you so much, ladies. This has been wonderful. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. We really appreciate it.